Now, last week as I preached, I gave you some terms to know. So I wanted to start in John 3.18. All right? Remember the first term was the word condemnation or the word to be condemned. And you know what the word condemned means? Everybody remembers. It means you're guilty. All right? The word condemned, that's all it means. You're guilty. Hey, and by the way, I am I carry Bibles to church. I'm not a big app guy or nothing like that. But if you ever go to church and you, you don't have a Bible app, go to your app thing and type in Bible.org. It is a great free app. You'll get like 40 different translations. You just click on the one you want. I use it all the time in my study when I'm cutting and pasting scriptures. And uh, so when I put scripture in there, I'll cut and paste it from Bible.org and put it into my sermon notes so I don't have to keep looking them all up to save a little bit of time. But uh, I'm a big believer in carrying the book, but if you don't carry it with you, don't get caught without it, all right? You can go to Bible.org. It is free. I don't get any royalties off that. I just want to help you to get there to open up God's Word, and it's one of the free apps that are out there that's really, really good. Now, John chapter 3 and verse 18, and we're going to read this verse together. And then we're going to look at the problem we have on the screen up here real quickly. John 3.18. You know what John 3.16 is, right? Everybody likes that one. Man, we, we get all excited for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever would believe in Jesus would not perish, but what? Would have everlasting life. Man, that's called good news. Really good news. Now look at verse 18. It's one of my favorite in all the scripture. All right? Here's what it says. Now, remember that word condemn, it means guilty, right? All right, everybody got it. Now, listen to what he says in verse 18. He who believes in Jesus is not guilty. And can we do it one more time? He who believes in Jesus is not condemned. You're not guilty. Listen, but he who does not believe in Jesus is condemned already. Because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Isn't it an amazing thing? Remember last week I talked about the fact that you either know Jesus or you don't know Jesus. You believe Jesus Christ is the Savior of the world and you've asked him to be your Lord and Savior or you do not know Jesus Christ as Lord and say, you, know, you may know all about him. You may that he died, died on the cross, lived a sinless life. You might know all that kind of stuff. That's called history. Salvation is that you personally know him as Lord and Savior. Now, I gave my life to Jesus when I was eight years old. When I was eight years old, sitting in a little charismatic church in Hamilton, Ohio, the gospel became alive to me, and the first time in my life I realized you don't go to heaven because you go to church. You don't go to heaven because you read the Bible in your home. You don't get to go to heaven because you go to church five times a week. Sunday morning, Sunday night, Monday night, Wednesday night, and Saturday night. Man, I got drugged to church every time the door was open. And then I'm sitting there one Sunday and preacher's preaching, and all of a sudden the gentleman preaching said to my mama, said, uh, would you come up, and the lady that played the piano, would you come up and just begin to play very softly on the piano? And my mama walked right in front of me, and when mom walked by me, I didn't know what it was time. Uh, it scared me to death to start out with, but when she walked by me, here's what the Holy Spirit of God spoke to, to an eight-year-old boy. You realize your mother's going someplace you ain't going. And, man, I'm telling you, you talk about something that hit me like a ton of bricks. Boy, I don't get to go to heaven because I go to church. I don't get to go to heaven because I've won all them little Bibles for memorizing all them little scripture verses when we used to stand up and recite all them verses. And I don't get to go to heaven. For, I don't get to go to heaven because we read the Bible in our home and we study it. No, I got to make a personal decision about Jesus Christ. He who believes in Jesus is not guilty. He who does not believe in Jesus is condemned. Why? Because he has not believed in the name of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the only way to get off of earth into a place called heaven, and you must receive him as Lord and personal Savior. Listen, this isn't a Baptist thing. This isn't a Catholic thing. This isn't a Presbyterian thing. It ain't a Methodist thing. It's not a Church of Christ thing. This is a Jesus thing. Do you know him as Lord and Savior? The old-time preachers used to say, listen, you need to get rid of your tags because if you go down, it'll burn off, and when you go up, it's going to drop off. You need to know Jesus Christ as Lord and personal Savior. So do you know him? Jesus looked at his guys one day, and he's got his huddle together. He's got his, he's got his core team right there. 
And I mean, it, it's just been crazy atmosphere around him. And people are walking away in bucket loads from Jesus because they don't like what he's teaching. And Jesus looked at his own guys one day and he said, listen, what think ye of Christ? Whose son is he? Is he the son of God or is he just another guy who blends in with the crowd? Listen, he's the king of kings and the Lord of lords. He's the only son of the only living God. And friend, he is coming again. And you must be ready for him. All right. Now, here's the problem we've got. I want to go to the screen real quick, just a little PowerPoint thing. And just kind of remind ourselves of our need for a savior. In God's design, there is, I use a little app called Three Circles when I'm, when I'm walking people through it. So you click to the next app there, guys, next screen for me. In God's design, keep clicking, you'll get there real quick. I promise it'll say God's design, amen, thank you very much. I might have to steal me one of them clickers up here, but I'm afraid my left leg would fall off if I did that. So understand God's design for you and I was perfect. We were created in perfection. We were created without sin. Problem was... We don't know how long Adam and Eve stayed without sin, but we know they did sin, and now because of their sin, it is now imputed. Remember that word we studied last week? Credited to our account. It's an accounting term. It was imputed to us the sin of Adam, and therefore the world became broken. God had a perfect design. His perfect design was destroyed by sin, and man became broken. And you see all them little squiggly lines? That's how we try to fix our brokenness. Some people, we try to dress it up a little better, don't we? We try to live a good life, and we think that'll get us off earth into heaven. Adam and Eve, what they do? They sewed up fig leaves. So as Operation Fig Leaves. And if I can sew up enough fig leaves and cover up my nakedness, then I can go in and make myself presentable to God. All right? And you can't do that. Remember what God did? God took off their fig leaves, slaughtered an animal, and with the blood still dripping, covered them with the skin of the animal. Why? Because without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. Doesn't happen. There had to be someone innocent that died. And we tried it. Man, we tried joining churches. We, I mean, we tried baptism. We tried singing in the choir, being a good person. We might go teach in the nursery for 30 years thinking that's going to get us out of purgatory. I mean, you know, I, I don't even believe in purgatory, by the way. But if you go there, I'm sure you don't have to go to purgatory. But... All that brokenness just leaves us in a mess. Go to the next circle, guys. Here's the good news. Somebody comes along and shares the good news with us. Salvation is free. It's a gift of God. You can't earn it. There's nothing you can do to merit it. It has to be received as a free gift. The wages of sin is death. There's a payment coming for that sin one day, and it's death. But the gift of God is is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. So we hear the gospel, and guess what happens? We repent, and we believe in Jesus. All right, so he who believes in Jesus is not guilty. He's not condemned. But he who does not believe in Jesus, he's condemned already because he hasn't believed in the name of Jesus Christ. So understand, we hear the gospel, and guess what? We now begin to recover and pursue Almighty God's design for our life. And we begin to live for Him, not because we, uh, or because we want to, not because we need to do it to be saved. We do it because we lo want to serve Him because He loves us and He cares for us. So it's a simple process. We broke God's rule. We broke God's heart. And because of that, Jesus Christ had to come to die for you and I. Now, in your notes this morning, if you've got an outline, great. If you don't, I'm going to give you seven things that aren't in your outline. I'm going to give them to you real quickly. Are you ready? Last week, we talked about this, and uh, I mentioned that there are actually seven deaths that are mentioned in Scripture. So I'm going to give you all seven. We're not going to cover all of them today. We're only going to cover three of them. But let me give you all seven. They'll come on the screen so you can write them down. But here they are. Number one is what we call physical death. And we're going, to, we're going to define what physical death is here in just a moment, okay? So physical death, the second one is spiritual death. And we're going to define what spiritual death is. All seven deaths mentioned in Scripture. The third one is called the second death. And the second death mentioned in Scripture, if I can get my outline to move here for me, it's kind of being contrary this morning. The second death we'll define in just a moment. The next one's called positional death. And we talked about this last Sunday morning. So if you weren't here, catch up. 
all right? And it go online, it's all free. Positional death means that you were taken back to the cross of Jesus Christ, and now in the heavens, your position is in Christ Jesus, and nothing can separate you from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. Nothing can. Absolutely nothing. Look at Romans 8, uh, and you go verses 35 to 38. There's nothing that can separate you from Christ. So in your position, you have died with Christ, and now you have been made alive to serve him. And then we talk about uh, temporal death is the fifth one. That's the zombie church. We'll talk about that in a couple of weeks when we talk about Sardis. You have a name that you're living, but you're dead. Okay, that's called the zombie church. And you'd walk into them anywhere in America. They walk around like this. Okay, or they walk around like this, dragging their foot. And nobody will say hi to you. There's nobody friendly. There's nobody growing. There's nothing's happening there. It's not alive. Uh, so we'll talk about it. You have a name that you're living. But you're dead. Now, remember, that was Jesus' review of the church of Sardis. wasn't mine. It was his. Okay? And then there's operational death. What do you mean by that? The Bible says faith without works is dead. So, I know Christ is Savior, but I'm no longer serving him. I've walked away from him. I'm doing my own thing. I did it in my life for about five years. All right? Most of us have done it before. Some of us will admit it. When I was 25, I walked out of church and said, if this is a church, who needs this? I'm tired of people fussing, fighting, and arguing. I'm out of here. I'm gone. All right? And for the next four and a half, almost four and a half, five years, I did nothing for the kingdom. If people got into the kingdom of God, they went around me. I didn't help get them there until I had to repent. I had to ask God to forgive me. But operationally, faith, yep, works. I was temporarily dead. Okay? Classic example of it's the prodigal son. My son was alive. He was dead. He's alive now. And so we could talk about that till Jesus comes back. Last one is pretty easy to understand, sexual death. And those two scriptures are around uh, Abraham and Sarah when Sarah was, I don't know, 95 or something like that. And, and God said, by the way, you're going to have a baby. Yikes. That had to take faith. That had to be a miracle. Amen. I mean, I'm 62. And if my wife comes in and says she's having a baby, somebody's in trouble. All right. Because I'm going to be an empty nester in about one year. I've never been an empty nester. And when Allie graduates, she is going away. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I raised two daughters. And then Allie, I've never been out of our house. And so, listen, she is going to go off somewhere I feel led. Because I'm going to enjoy this for about a month. I mean, I want a month of peace and quiet. You all all right? So I can't wait for that, but uh, that's just the ability you can't uh, procreate anymore. All right, now, let's get into your outlines real quickly, and what we're going to talk about this morning, I'm glad you came to church because we're going to talk about dying. <laughs> Aren't you glad you came? Oh, I'm so glad I came. It's one of the greatest studies you can do. Get a bunch of kids together, or get a bunch of teenagers together, sit around, drink some RCs, eat some moon pies, and talk about who's going to die next. I mean, it's just wonderful. Man, it's just like, oh, really cool. Now, you know, understand young people are fascinated with death. Uh, boy, every cult out there is trying to start some kind of a cult so you can get around death. And so you've got vampire cults that uh, all they're doing is showing you another alternative in the demonic where they think you can do death. And now you've got zombie death, you know. And then you've got the voodoo guys and all the guys down there that get all these trances and go, listen, they're just trying to escape the fact that you are going to live on somewhere forever and you got a hearing with God and he determines where you live, where you're going to live at forever. All right? So in your notes, Revelation chapter 21, let's begin there. Revelation 21. And we want to talk about this thing called death and I got to do it in a hurry. Everybody, all right, I got a lot of notes on there, and I got to do it in a hurry. I love the amount. One of my, I have the, some of the stupidest jokes that I like. I really like the one about the chicken, though, one laying egg on the interstate. And the chicken stood there, and the rooster came up and looked at him real quick, said, what do you want to do? I want to lay an egg on the interstate. He said, listen, I can tell you how to do it. Lay it on the line and do it quick. Isn't that a great joke? Some of y'all get that. In the car on the way home, you'll start laughing, and your kid's going to go, what are you laughing at? And, oh, that's that stupid joke that preacher told. So understand, we're going to study just about death this morning. We're going to talk about dying because we're all going to die one day. 
Hey, I'll be 62 in August. Average guy lives to be 70. I've got eight years left if I'm average. Y'all all right? Some of you looking back, aren't you, going, man, golly, preacher, thank you so much. I'm like 73. I'm getting ready to keel over, I guess. Now, you don't know how long you're going to be here. The guy, Bible says if you get three score in 10 years, 70 years, you're blessed. So understand, I got eight more years. I get to determine how I spend them. I get to determine, am I going to use these next eight years to point people to Christ, or am I going to do my own thing? So that's bottom line. Revelation 21, verse 1, Now I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. Also there was no more sea. There's nothing that separates. Then I, John, saw the holy city, new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God, and God will wipe away every tear from their eye. There will be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There should be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. Then he who sat on the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said unto me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. He said unto me, It's done. I am the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give of the fountain of the water of life freely to him who thirsts. He who overcomes shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. Then he goes into a list of those who have never said yes to him. But the cowardly, the unbelieving, the abominable, the murderers, the sexual immorality, the sorcerers, Greek word for drug drug addicts, the idolaters, all liars shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Now, Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 9. I'm going to give you some good news, and then we're going to talk about what is physical death. Turn there real quickly. Hebrews is about three books to the left. If you go to the right, you're in the maps. Turn to the left, about three books. Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 9. Let me give you some good news. We get enough bad news, don't we? Let's get some more good news. Man, I like good news. Now, I tell you, the older I get, it's great news. It ain't good news no more. It's great news. All right, here we go. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 9. But we see Jesus who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that Jesus, by the grace of God, might taste death for everyone. Listen, when Jesus Christ died on the cross, the sting of death, you want to know where it's at today? It's in Jesus. Jesus paid the penalty for death. Jesus took the sting of death. There's no reason why anyone should spend an eternity separated from God now because Jesus Christ, and by the way, to all my Calvinistic brothers who still can't interpret Scripture properly, he died for everyone. He just didn't die for the elect. He died for everyone everyone. And man's got to make a decision. Do I believe Jesus died for me? And am I going to humble myself before him? We would heard a whole category of people who won't do it. The cowardly, those who, just because of fear, they won't, they won't say yes to Jesus. The unbelieving, just people who choose not. It's not that they can't believe. They won't believe. And then he goes into a whole list of things that people substitute for goodness or happiness in their life. So understand, we're all going to die one day. Would you do a favor? Look at your neighbor and say this. You're going to die one day. Would you do that real quick? Hey, listen, have a little bit more fun with them. Let them know. I bet you go before I do. (laughs) I bet you go before I do. Hey, listen, here's here's what James said in James chapter 4. What is your life? It's but a vapor. It's here for a moment, and it's gone. Go outside on a cold day. That's probably a day. (laughs) In Ohio, it's probably still a day. We're we're still cutting grass and and snow on it, all right? Hey, go outside, take a breath. James says, what is your life? It's but a vapor. It appears for a moment, and it's gone. 
So understand, that's how quick life goes by. And let me, let me say one more thing that I say a lot around here, but I'm going to say it again just so you'll never forget it. We're going to spend more time on the other side than what we think. We're going to be there a lot longer than what we think. That's why we've got to be prepared to go to the other side, and we've got to find him as Lord and personal Savior. All right, in your notes, what is physical death? Let's get it down, get it down straight. Physical death is the separation of the human soul, which is the real person from his body, his earthly tent, as it's called in 2 Corinthians 5. For we know that if our earthly house, this tent is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For in this we groan, earnestly desiring to be clothed with our habitation, which is from heaven. If indeed, having been clothed, we shall not be found naked. Paul says, knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. We beg men to come to Jesus Christ in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. So physical death is the separation of the soul from the body. Your body, your, your body is not dead when your heart starts beating. Your body is dead when your soul evacuates the body. That's why every now and then people can be revived. Half hour, ten minutes, five minutes afterwards, they can be brought back from the, from the dead. And, and people always go, do, 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 did they see stuff? Well, listen, if, if they see stuff and it matches with heaven, it's fine. If they see stuff and it doesn't match with heaven, they probably had too much pizza before they died. <laughs> Am I okay? All right, so understand uh, I don't believe in a lot of those visions that you see out there, and they make movies about them, and you can believe what you want, okay? Uh, I just know one thing. When the soul evacuates the body and leaves, when your soul and spirit is gone, you are gone. Remember what Jesus said? He's hanging on the cross. Who took Jesus' life? Remember what happened? Jesus said, uh, my father has given me the right to take my own life, and he also given me my, the right to take it back up again. So Jesus, when he there in the penalty of sin is paid, Father, it's finished. What did he do? Into thy hands I dismiss my spirit. And he simply exhaled his last breath and he did not inhale again. The soul and the spirit of a believer when they evacuate the body, the unbeliever only has a soul. It doesn't have a human spirit. He's not come to Jesus yet. So understand, when the soul for an unbeliever leaves or the soul and spirit for the believer leave the body, then the body is physically dead. All right, now, in your notes, when the believer dies, number one, his human spirit accompanies his soul to heaven, and he is said to be absent from the body and face-to-face -face with the Lord or present with the Lord. It means to be face-to-face. So, when the believer dies, his human spirit accompanies his soul, and he is said to be absent from the body and face-to-face -face with the Lord. Number two, when the unbeliever dies, his soul, he does not have a human spirit, we'll talk about that later, goes to a place called Hades to await the last judgment where he will be receiving the sentence to the lake of fire. The final destination for both unbelievers in mankind and the final destination for the fallen angels. It is a literal and eternal place of judgment from the justice of God for those who have rejected the plan of grace for salvation. So understand, when the believer dies, soul and spirit, face to face with the Lord. When the unbeliever dies, he goes to a temporary holding tank called Hades. Uh, there is no such place called limbo or any, any of these purgatory, any of these other things that somebody made up 1,200 years after the death of Jesus Christ. It doesn't exist. It is heresy. It's false doctrine, and I don't care what pope decreed it. It is false doctrine. Here's the last words in the book of Revelation. Nobody adds to this book. So somebody else doesn't write a document, nor does a guy named Joseph Smith write a document, or Mary Better Eddie Baker, 19 last names, write another document and tell you they got an epiphany from Jesus Christ. When you leave this life, you're going to one of two places. You're going to go to the presence of the Father, or you're going to go to hell, period. That's good preaching, Jesus. Man, I'm telling you, we're having a ball here, aren't we? Now, what is spiritual death? In your notes. 
Spiritual death is no relationship with God in time. Have you got it? No relationship with God in time. That's spiritual death on earth. We are born physically alive, but spiritually dead, possessing an old sin nature, and again, the imputed sin of Adam. It was credited to our account. Note the difference now. The second death is the perpetuation of spiritual death into eternity, or it is eternal separation from God. All right? Spiritual death, I have no relationship with God in time. The second death, I die in time I go to eternity, and now I receive the second death, spiritual separation from God for eternity. See, the horror of hell, as horrific it's going to be anyway, as a lake of fire and a place where the worm does not die and is weeping and gnashing of teeth and they're screaming and crying, and, and, and it's a place where you are alone, that's bad enough. Here's the real horror of hell. There's no God to turn to. Hell is the absence of God. That's the horror of hell. And when you get there, you'll be like the, the uh, rich man and the beggar. And what the rich man did, the moment he saw Father Abraham, he starts begging. Listen, let Abraham come and let Lazarus come and dip his finger in water and come and cool my tongue for I'm tormented in this flame. Abe said, we can't do it, bud. Uh, you've made your choice. We can't come. You can't come to us. We can never come to you again. Okay, Father Abraham, if that's the case, listen, I've got five brothers still living. Send somebody back. Send Moses. Send one of the prophets. Send somebody back and tell my five brothers, don't come to this place. Whatever you do, don't come here. So physical death and spiritual death. Now, we also would make a real quick note, and I did it in bold in your notes. Death is administered by the sovereignty of God. All right? Job probably said it best in Job 121, the Lord gave, the Lord has what? Taken away, blessed be the name of the Lord. So, physical death is administered by the sovereignty of Almighty God. Now, in your notes, let's look at the unbeliever facing death. And I'm going to go quickly, so follow with me. To the unbeliever, letter A in your notes, death is a reminder that time on earth is very short. It's very short. Again, I quoted James 4, 14, whereas you do not know what will happen tomorrow. For what is your life? It's even a vapor that appears for a moment, and then it's gone. Letter B, death is also a reminder of the futility of this world's glory. Let me tell you something. You know how much you're going to leave behind? <laughs> every bit of it. Y'all all right? You're going to leave every bit of it behind. I could tell you another corny joke there, but I won't just for the sake of time. And for your, you all have been here for a while, you've heard it a hundred times, but it's still a good joke. Let us see. For the unbeliever, there is no hope beyond the grave, only the anticipation of eternal judgment. See, here's what's going to happen in eternity while you're in hell, sir or ma'am, if you don't know him. You're going you're gonna to know I've got a hearing that I've got to stand before God, and what am I going to tell him? What am I going to tell him when I stand before him? Because the book of Romans says people are going to tell him all kinds of stuff. Jesus, even in the Sermon on the Mount, remember what he said? Many will say to me in that day, Lord, we prophesied in your name. Lord, we cast out devils in your name. Lord, we did mighty deeds in your name. And what Jesus said, I didn't say that Jesus said it. Listen, sir, I, I'm sorry. Ma'am, I'm sorry. I, I don't know who you are. I never knew you. What are we going to say? What are we going to say? And, and here's what Romans chapter 3 says. When people stand before God, those that are lost, they're going to give him their resume. They're going to say all kinds of stuff. And remember, Jesus got all the facts. He's got them all. And the Bible says, listen, Romans chapter 3. Here's what it says. Don't miss it. And every mouth will be stopped. Everyone will be stopped. I don't know how it's going to happen. Here, here's how, Kenny, here's how kind of I think it's going to happen. I, I, this is First Timothy. Chapter 2, okay? So understand, I'm taking a lot of theological liberty here, but I, this is how I think it's going to happen. People are going to stand, and they're going to be standing, and the, the Lord's on the throne, and they're looking up, and they're giving him his resume. They're telling him all this stuff. And, and I honestly, I think Jesus just walk up and push the button, and things will start rolling on the screen. 
And you know what will start rolling? Every opportunity you had to say yes to Jesus. Every opportunity. Went to a restaurant last night. We bowed our heads and prayed. I look up and there's a table snickering at me. It didn't hurt my feelings. Are you listening? It broke my heart. Because if they don't know Jesus, that tape will be rewound one day. Hey, listen, I, I put a guy right in front of you to remind you who I was, and you laughed at him. So understand, the world, we all expect that. We're on enemy territory, and we're supposed to represent Christ, okay? So understand, that's what it's going to be like one day, all right? So there's no hope for the unbeliever beyond the grave. Uh, Paul wrote and said, if in this life only we have hope, we are men most miserable. Letter D, the unbeliever facing death is also reminded that he dare not take tomorrow for granted. Don't do it. I love uh, Proverbs 27.1. If you don't know it by memory, you ought to use it every now and then. Do not boast about tomorrow, for you do not know what a day may bring forth. Do you hear that? Don't boast about tomorrow. That's arrogance. You do not know. That's ignorance. You do not know what that day is going to bring about. Friend, that's diligence right there. The day's coming. Are you prepared for it? Finally, death to the believe unbeliever is the reminder of the certainty of judgment for those who are unprepared to meet Jesus. John chapter 3, again, verse 36. Listen to this one. He who has the Son of God has life. But he who does not have the Son of God, he does not have life, but the wrath of God abides on him. Now the believer facing death. Everybody good? Look at your neighbor and go, man, I'm, I'm glad it's getting the good news. Woo, thank God we got the good news. We're about halfway through that moon pie. Man, it's tasting better now every bite. The believer facing death. Psalm 116 is another one of my favorites. I quote it a lot when I'm at the bedside of someone who's going home. Are you listening? Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. It's precious. It's heartbreaking for us. Can I get a witness? Right now, every day, watching my mother-in-law, just in who knows how much longer she'll be with us. She can no longer feed herself and can't hardly remember to swallow. She's been going downhill for four years now. Donna going over, feeding her lunch every day, telling her how much she loves her. Listen, are, are you listening? The Bible says it's precious in the sight of the Lord, the death of his saints, those who know him. See, I don't understand, God. You, are you still trying to figure him out? Can I help you on this one? That's a lot of futility right there. Listen, Solomon said, listen, if you're trying to figure out God's like trying to grasp oil. Did you ever try to grasp oil? Just get you a can of oil out this day and figure it out. That's how much you'll figure out God. I don't know why he does what he does. My job's not to understand why. My job's to trust him. Trust him. Because this God is an awesome God. Now, for the, un for the believer in Christ, letter A, no appointment with judgment or of wrath. None whatsoever. And that is really good news. It is impossible for the child of God to experience the wrath of God. That's why, why, by the way, when we start the tribulation in two weeks and we study the seven years of tribulation, it's the wrath of God poured out on earth. It's impossible for a believer to be here during the tribulation, a member of the body of Christ as far as the church is concerned. The church of God has been promised that she would never be appointed to wrath. That's why we're going home. Some of you can stick around for half of it. The deacons will have service, and it'll be fine. All right? Letter B. No appointment with judgment, letter A. Letter B, face-to-face -face with the Lord. It's not face-to-face -face out there hoping to see him. You're going to be face-to-face -face with him. Letter C, the removal of everything associated with death. Tears, sorrow, crying, pain. It's all gone. No more separation. Letter D, you get an eternal inheritance. You get an inheritance that is incorruptible, according to 1 Peter, undefiled, does not fade away, and it's been reserved in heaven for you who are kept by the power of God through faith for salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. You also get a new home. Jesus said in John 14, 6, let not your heart be troubled. 
If you believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house, and we'd like to translate that word mansions, in my Father's house are many abiding places. But we're not so I'd have told you. I'm going to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare that place, I will come again and receive you so that you may be with me where I am at. Letter F is the perpetuation of eternal life forever. Forever. And this is the testimony, 1 John 5, 11 and 12, that God has given us eternal life and this life is in his Son. He who has the Son has life and he who does not have the Son of God does not have life. John 10, 28, Jesus said, and I will give them eternal life and they shall never perish, neither shall anyone snatch them out of my Father's hand. Letter G, you're going to get a resurrection body. Look at your neighbor and go, thank God you're getting a new body. Man, this one's wore out. Y'all all right? When the rapture happens, they're going to be a big pile of screws, nuts, and bolts laying right here. There'll be an artificial hip. There'll be two steel plates. I think 17 screws I still have in my arms and legs. All that's going to be laying right here with a pair of clean underwear. Everybody all right? <laughs> and I'm getting a new body. And I'm going home. And I joke about it a lot, but friend, let me, help, let me tell you, just, I haven't been able to run in almost 30 years now, a little over 30 years, Kenny. When I get to heaven, there's a little blur goes by you. Yeah, I'm on my first lap. <laughs> See, y'all like to run down here. Dave loves to run down here. I don't run down here because the Bible says the wicked run when no one's pursuing. <laughs> okay? So I don't run much down here, but when I get up there, buddy, I'm going to cut a streak all over heaven. Why? Because I got a new body. This one's wore out, but I got a new body in Christ Jesus. Man, I'm telling you, here's what Paul said in Philippians chapter 1, and I close with this. For to me, to live is Christ. Listen, to die is gain. Can I say it again? Paul said to me, to live is Christ. While I'm on this planet, I live for Christ. To die, it's gain. Listen, you don't get, live a Christian life down here as some penalty to get to go to heaven. You live a Christian life down here so he can give you everything in heaven. But if I live on in the flesh, Paul said, this will mean fruit for my labor. Yet what I choose, I cannot tell, for I am hard-pressed, Paul said, between the two. I have a desire. I want to go home, and I want to be with Christ, which is far better. While I'm here, I will serve him till he calls me home. Father, in Jesus' name, thank you. Thank you for your word. Your word is living, and it is powerful. Man, it's sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of our soul and spirit and of the joints and the marrow, and it's a critic of the thoughts and intents of our heart. And Father, there is no creature hidden from your sight, but everyone is naked before you, before Jesus to whom we must give an account. Father, I, I pray today, if there's anyone here, they, they don't know our Savior. That today, in this quiet moment, they would say, Jesus, I need you in my life. The preacher's right. I know about you, but I don't know you. I've never in my heart said, Jesus, I believe you're my Savior. And today, Jesus, I say yes. Thank you for dying for my sins. Thank you for giving me the free gift of eternal life. Jesus, today I receive that gift. Thank you for loving me. And Father, I pray also today, I pray for the child of God who may be here, may, maybe like I was years ago, walked out and walked away and got a little disoriented about why we were here. But Lord, you're calling them back home today. They know you, but you're calling them back to service today. You're calling them home. Lord Jesus, do a work in our lives this morning. I pray that no one at the sound of my voice escapes doing business with you, sir. The King of kings and the Lord of lords. We love you, Lord, in Jesus' name.